Okay, so everyone's all right? Yep. 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 All good. All right, so this is uh, our lecture one, in which I'll be talking about uh, the definition of what combat archaeology is. Um, I'll talk about sources and material evidence. Uh, the methodologies of research, which we do, and I would encourage uh, you to participate in as well. Um, some of you may think of taking this sort of work into uh, uh, your dissertations, your BA dissertation or your MA dissertations. And so I'll talk about what, what we mean by the methodologies of research. Uh, in this particular subject. As you are already aware, there are mainstream crossovers, which is why I asked you about martial arts and I asked you about HEMA and that sort of thing, historical European martial arts. There is, in that sense, an academic crossover between what we try to do in the universities with research and with popular interest. Um, then I'll talk about course structure, uh, the content, um, lectures, practicals, and assessments. Um, this, this may be a short lecture, but then we can still chat a bit afterwards. So, why combat archaeology and or not the archaeology of warfare? Um, there is a great amount of research on, on warfare, the um, history of warfare, archaeology of warfare, etc, etc. But what's the difference between that and combat archaeology? For me, combat archaeology, and I suppose that was why I first coined the term um, a long time ago, is the idea of putting, putting the human touch, if you like, uh, a human-centered approach to the functionality of artifacts. It was the basic idea of something which I would guess that all of us have felt. You see a weapon in a glass case in a museum and you want to put your hand through the glass to feel it. Because this is about not what things look like, not things distance. Weapons are very close to the person. They don't exist other than to be used. And so that was what interested me, not what weapons looked like, but what they felt like. So from that point of view, I'm more interested in the personal experience of violence and combat. The archaeology or the history of warfare, warfare is about cultures, it's about civilizations, it's about communities. But what I'm really interested in here is the idea of the individual personal experience. Um, because it is, after all, the people that make for violence and combat and warfare. It's not an abstraction, it's a real thing. So the consequence of this is that um, what we've been doing is developing what I would regard as experiential, body-centered methods of research. And that's where the handling of a weapon comes in, not the sight of it. It's, your, it's the personal experience of the material culture, which is important. Educationally, probably the person who's influenced me most on this is um, Howard Gardner, and some of you may have come across him because he's the person in education who's talked about multiple intelligences, that people learn in different ways. So for example, I've taken a particular interest in how dyslexics learn, partly because two of my children are dyslexic, um, but it's also the sense of, um, in this module, in previous things, I've had my best ever student was dyslexic. Um, and it was a real sense of, of being able, to, suddenly his intellectual capacity was able to, to flower. So I would hope that that would be true of some of you as well. So the sources of material are, 
weapons. Swords, spears, bows, arrows, knives, axes, shields, etc. For obvious reasons, the limitation of this course and partly personal preferences, I'm going to concentrate within this module on, on swords, how they change and how they're used. Um, apart from the weapons themselves, we'll also be looking at images. Um, I don't know whether we actually do look at any cave paintings, but we will look at wall paintings, vase paintings, sculpture, prints, etc. This is important because of the relationship between image and text. Historical European martial arts um, are based primarily on textual sources, um, ancient combat manuals from the medieval period through to the Renaissance uh, and modern times. Um, but supposing you've just got pictures, how do you interpret a picture? How do you interpret just a two-dimensional image without instructions? And that's a challenge. I do believe it can be done. Um, and I will show you some examples uh, as we move through. And then, of course, now there is an absolute revolution going on with bones and the study of bones and injuries. And uh, that is a, a, a source material we can use as well. Now, the weapons have always been of interest to archaeologists. Um, the conventional way of approaching artifacts in archaeology is through what we would call what we call typologies and i'll give an illustration of what a typology uh, would would mean and i would guess if you've done any archaeology you, you have an idea of what a typology is and people classify it's a way of classifying and finding categories Conventionally, this is done through visual appearance, through what we might call iconographic, um, the idea of the icon, the idea of what you see. Um, but that doesn't always follow what we would um, think of as the use of something what it looks like and what it's used how it's used and how it feels there can be some uh, differences so we're going to use what you might call two more body centered not merely visual but multi-sensory approaches and that is that we're going to use some experimental methodologies and experiential methodologies those of you who are doing uh, experimental archaeology uh, will be will have some sense of what experimental does. Now, you should know that uh, Brendan and I have a little bit of a dis difference of, of opinion about the importance of experimental versus experiential. I very much think that the human experience, which is the qualitative qualitative approach uh, to this stuff. Um, is important. Um, Brendan prefers the idea of the quantitative, the experimental. And, uh, you know, we work together on this, but you should have that in mind that there are two approaches, um, the experimental and the experiential. Experimental methods in uh, archaeology, of course, do go back to um, the British Butser Hill ancient farm um, project, which goes back to the 19, 1960s. And the man who developed that was a man called Peter Reynolds. And as you can see from the picture on screen that uh, what you're seeing here, can you see the red dot, yes? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can see yes. this is the yeah, Butler yeah. Hill. Um, this, you know, they've made a, a, a proper uh, wattle fence. They made houses, and so what they did was they experiment with, experimented with construction methods. 
they experimented here, as you see, with uh, uh, firing metals. This is uh, extracting, uh, extracting metals. So all of this is, is, you know, is relevant to the sort of work that we're interested in. Now, let's apply that to weapons. So the experimental approach, you can say, is, well, how do you make ancient weapons? Yeah, what's the metallurgy? How do you create the appropriate bronze um, for this? Uh, how do you get the right mixtures of copper and tin? I mean, you could use modern industrial bronze if you wanted, but that would be nothing like as accurate as actually trying to work out by analysis and by experimentation what sort of um, admixture, what sort of uh, combination of copper and tin went into the, to the bronze. And if you are interested in modern um, bronze replicas, you need to look at Neil Burridge's uh, website. He makes and sells a good quality um, bronze, uh, bronze replicas from all different periods and all different ages. Um, so he's the man to, um, to go to. I'll give a link to his, uh, his website later. So most of the bronze swords which Barry and Barry Malloy and I have um, are either made by Barry himself um, or they are Neil's um, uh, Neil's uh, replicas. So is that clear so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, I'd say so. Yep. So. So that's experimental research. What about experiential research? Well, there is a recent movement in archaeology, which some people have entitled a sensuous archaeology. That's an archaeology of the senses. And the two most important people um, in terms of the theory of this have been Tim Insull and Yanis uh, Hamilakis. You see, there is stuff in something that is uh, well. It's something which has been called the tyranny of the gaze. Yeah, and this came from a French philosopher called Foucault. Um, gaze being G-A-Z-E, of course. Um, the idea that, that everything is as it is seen. It is visual. But of course, we have five senses. And therefore, in archaeology, there has been an increasing move to, well, what's the, the, the much more multi-layered sensory process that we can bring to the study of uh, to the study of archaeology. Um, uh, some of you may be working with uh, Mariel McClatchy, of course, who's interested in cooking, which is another sensory approach uh, to archaeology: the idea of taste and smell. And this is further expressed with the idea that the body itself is a tool of analysis and interpretation. Not just the mind, but that your physical senses can inform the mind, can give the mind something to work on, to analyze. It's not just the stuff which happens in your head. In terms of uh, what this is called in psychology is embodied cognition. The cognitive process of your mind, as is, as is done through um, uh, reaction with the body. Um, so, embodied cognition is a big deal even now in, in, in neuroscience. 
the, the particular relationship between the body and the mind um, is um, something that is research, researched on various levels. I don't know whether any of you do, do meditation or mindfulness um, or do anything like uh, um, Tai Chi and Qigong and yoga. The idea of how the body and the mind interact in subtle ways is part of embodied cognition. Now, the traditional Western way of approaching embodied cognitive or embodied the, the relationship between mind and body is to privilege the mind over the body. But it's the mind which is more, most important, not the body. And this, of course, comes from, from Descartes, um, the la famous Latin phrase, cogito ergo sum, I only know I'm alive, I think therefore I am. It's only because I can think that I'm alive that I am alive. Well, there are problems with that. It's, 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 yeah, there's more to it than that. So up till recently, psychological theorizing was the dominance of the mind over the body. And what we seek to do is to try and uh, shift that. So embodied cognition demonstrates that the mind and the body are together. They're far more equal in the relationship than has been thought. The body thinks, but movement improves cognition. There's a lot of research, for example, that demonstrates that keeping moving, particularly as you move into old age, will hold off cognitive decline like dementia and so on and so forth. And it also has a relationship too with a growing research interest uh, through um, a psychologist by the name of uh, Ian McGilchrist of how the left and right hemispheres of the brain um, integrate and work together. And this has certainly had, uh, has an effect in both anthropology and archaeology. So experiential approaches to anthropology um, the key text, the key research, is Keller and Keller. Cognition and tool use, the blacksmith at work. Um, the Kellers, um, husband and wife, learned how to be blacksmiths. And they realized that in the manipulation of the metal, it wasn't the, for, the, the intellectual formulae that were important. It was actually how they sensed that the metal was changing as they could feel through the tools to their hands. So there was something very important here about the sensory process. Um, in terms of archeology, span um, the doyen of course of most important living archaeologist is Colin Renfrew, um, now retired, but much of his work uh, was to find an archaeology of the mind. That archaeology wasn't just about objects, it was about the human mind. So you should look at some of his work as well. So altogether, this idea of looking at uh, experiential approaches, it's that there are skill sets and skill sets are dynamic adaptive processes. The making of a weapon or the making of anything is a skill set. It is dynamic, <coughs> it is adaptive, but then so is using a weapon. So it's not just a matter of how do you make a weapon, it's how do you use it. And one of the things that we have um, quite a lot of information about uh, where we do have texts is that particularly in the past before large-scale industrialization weapons were often made as a collaboration between the metal worker and the person who was going to use a weapon it would be made to your specifications often yeah, so, you know, you would go, you'd handle it, you say, I want a bit more weight here, 
I want to adjust to make the handle a little smaller, a little larger. Um, I don't feel comfortable with that length of blade. So these sorts of things, they're much more individualized. So weapons engage two types of cognition, how they're made and how they are used. And what interests us is how they're used because you can take all the time you want to make a weapon. You're not under stress. But how a weapon is used, well, your life depends on that. You are under very severe stress in being able to use that skill set. So how does that affect how we understand an archaeological artifact? Um, so I thought, I thought to show you this particular example. Uh, this is a Mycenaean Greek suit of armor called the Dendra corslet. Um, it looks very solid. It looks very heavy. Um, it looks unwieldy. And here you see my colleague, uh, Dr. Barry Malloy, wearing a replica of it. And I've worn another replica that that was many years ago when I was considerably thinner. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it's actually quite easy to move around in. So you look at it and you see this sort of solid metal, but then you wear it and other things come into play. Now we talked a little bit about cross crossovers and there were things that I asked you about. So I suppose the beginning of this in contemporary times is um, society creative anachronism and then that became LARP, um, which of course is World of Warcraft, but not online, you dress up. How many of you here do LARP? Anyone going to admit to it? It depends on what you consider LARPing. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that shows somebody who's got a sense of style with it, I think. Um, yes, and that includes, uh, you know, historical reenactment societies, which do go back quite a long way. And of course, it obviously includes Asian uh, martial arts, historically European martial arts. And <clears throat> um, I don't know what, how, whether you realize, but the interest in historical martial arts is only about 25 years old. And it happened because, partly because a group, of, many people who were involved in Asian martial arts became very disillusioned. Um, there were and still are problems in the way that Asian martial arts is done in Europe. Um, and so there was this sense of disillusion. And then literally in the mid nineties, people discovered this whole series of ancient manuscripts and printed books, which had been forgotten about. They would, were known about um, in the late Victorian period, and they were rediscovered about a hundred years later, i.e. in the mid nineties. And they have now completely changed the face of, of, of uh, martial arts uh, around the world. Reenactment societies, probably the earliest famous reenactment society was a, a group in England called the Sealed Knot. Um, they were a group who s decided to reenact the battles of the um, English Civil War um, with uh, uh, parliamentarians, musketeers, you know, Cromwell versus um, the Royalists, this sort of stuff. And uh, they started off uh, in a small way, but rapidly um, started to do these, these uh, sorts of, uh, these, these battles, uh, very dramatic. Um, and of course, those of you who 
um, no America will be aware that there are a great number of American Civil War reenactment groups as well. This has proliferated. So um, there are in Britain and in Europe a great number of Roman groups, uh, Roman reenactment groups. Um, the Chester, um, the Chester group is uh, one of the biggest. So, for example, if you see a documentary about uh, uh, the Romans in Britain, it's usually those guys that get called upon uh, to do, you know, the marching through the countryside or being attacked by um, various uh, hairy blue covered Celts and Britons. Um, in Greece now, uh, there are a number of people who uh, dress up as hoplites. Um, and here we have another, um, I think this is a Society of Creative Anachronism uh, group. So, medieval fight books. I do want to stress the point that they were known about in the Victorian period, late Victorian period. And there were a number of key figures in the Victorian period who became interested in looking at these books and trying to reestablish um, medieval fighting. Um, this was partly because of a great interest in the Victorian period in things medieval, um, the pre-Raphaelite painters and poets, etc. Um, people, designers and artists like William Morris. And so this is all part of a, a milieu um, in, in uh, um, the Victorian um, aesthetic, shall we say, of the time. So there were this group of uh, people who tried to rediscover how to fight. But then the books were forgotten and the skills were forgotten through a very important catastrophic event. Can any of you think what that event might have been? Fire of London? Nope. Oh, that's too late. You're talking immediately after the Victorian period. The First World War? First World War, yes, absolutely. You see, there were a great number of young men who learned how to sword fight um, in the 1890s uh, and then in the early 1900s. And then they all got killed. And that is the reason why this whole uh, layer of scholarship was lost. And then it took a hundred years for it to come back. So the, I'll talk about some of these in the course, but I'm introducing them here. Probably the earliest of the fight books that we have, the earliest surviving fight book uh, that we have. Now this word here is the fact book is simply the German for that. This is the earliest fight book. It's um, the Tower of London 133. It's originally uh, Latin and German, um, and it shows two monks fighting. Now, the period 1280 is important, as you see. This is the period of the Crusades, of the late Crusades. So if you want to know how the Crusaders fought, this is how they fought. This is their style of fighting. Um, now the Sorry. Why, sorry? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Since I have an interest in medieval history, uh, I was wondering, because especially during the early Crusades, monks weren't allowed to use sharp weapons. So, and what I seem to be seeing in this illustration are swords. So how would that go together? Well, it's, shall we, so let me put it this way. This is the style of the warriors of the time of the Crusades. Um, and of course they were fighting plenty of wars with sharp weapons 
uh, in, in, in Europe. And one of the things that you see that they are two, they're, they're monks, a number of monk, a number of warriors, when they retired, retired to monasteries. And so what you have here is you have um, the master and the pupil, and that's what's represented what's represented here. There's a lot of work that's been done. The book has been published. You contact me and we, we can have a chat and I'll, I can direct you to um, a lot of the work that's been done on this. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Um, the most influential book, however, um, that has influenced the current generation of people doing HEMA is this, Fiori de Liberi. Um, written in the early 1400s by an Italian master of arms who was the um, master of arms, martial arts instructor of an Italian duke. He has a very, uh, what the, the importance of his book is that he has a system going from empty hands to uh, empty hands against knife, knife on knife, uh, sword on sword, um, all the way up till f to fighting on, on horseback. And it's a well laid out structured system. It's not just a few techniques. And so we'll have a look in a little bit more detail at this book as well. Okay, do the next one. Now let's talk a little bit about bones. Um, As the sophistication of forensic um, uh, forensic archaeology increases, um, the the sorts of things that we're able to find out about uh, um, weapon injuries on bones, um, cemetery excavations, um, particularly battlefield cemetery excavations, um, so we can look and see bone injuries from different types of weapons, whether it was a somebody was killed with a club, somebody was um, uh, killed with a sword, they make different injuries. Um, the most important and comprehensive text uh, which you should try and look at is called The Blood Red Roses. And this uh, is the excavation of a cemetery um, from the first of the English Civil Wars, the, the, the Wars of the Roses. Um, and so you can see, for example, here very clearly um, in the cover of the book, um, major injury to the side of the face. And you can tell that that person was killed probably by an opponent who was right handed. How can you tell that? Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's the left side of his face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what can you see is the injury here? The slash with the left. Yeah, slash. Yeah. Right. There are plenty of other cemeteries. Um, we'll talk about the gladiator cemeteries when we talk about gladiators from York and Ephesus um, that were in the news recently. Now I want to talk to, just to give you an example of um, what I meant about typologies and both the usefulness and the limitations of conventional typologies. Um, now we're going to talk about bronze swords, particularly uh, Minoan and Mycenaean bronze swords uh, in future lecture, because of course, you know, I am a, I am a, a, a Minoan specialist uh, in my normal research. So here you have the typology of Minoan and Mycenaean Greek Bronze Age swords. And you can see very clearly how they have been um, given a typology based of, on the hilts. Yes? So a rounded hilt becomes a squared hilt, becomes a horned guard, a T-shaped guard, and then a squared and uh, a fish-shaped guard. Yes? So that is pretty clear. Yeah? Yep. Yep. <laughs> but then you, you actually show the swords at their full size. 
And there are really very important things that you can see. I mean, does it really matter if their guards are, well, it might matter if they were all the same size. But so, for example, when you're taking these two swords that are actually a pair of swords in the way that they're found in tombs, they're found together. You know, one is used for a very clearly different type of fighting than the other. So you do need to take into account the whole weapon, not just the hilt. You need to take into account its length, its balance, and whether or not it sit, how it sits in the hand. So for example, this is, if we go back, this is a type C sword. This is a type D sword. They're contemporary. Yep. Ah. So here we have a type C sword, the one with the horned guard. And this is use, this is, has a very particular, when you pick it up, you immediately can sense it point forward. Yes, it's suitable for being able to, if you like, do something like conventional fencing, uh, dueling, one-on-one. -on -one. And this really tells you something about the fighting that was designed for this type of sword, about the culture that de de created this sword. It's an aristocratic, dueling type of uh, society. But what about this sword? This sword is shorter. Yes, you don't keep the opponent at long distance. This type of sword is about three to four hundred years later than the type C dueling sword. This is a type of sword that's useful for fighting in a battle. It's not very useful for dueling. This is a short range battle sword. And I'll show you how the difference in how they handle and how we can look at the weapon, the feel of the weapon, and actually get a sense of, well, this is what it's used for. The weapon itself is telling you something about the society that created it. So, as I said, we'll talk about that. It's just to give you a brief glimpse of what we'll be doing. So, here are some basic books, um, which I recommend in the bibliography. Um, these books are probably useful for you, um, whether you choose to get all of them or none of them or whatever is entirely up to you. Um, uh, cutting Edge, um, Barry put together a series of a group of scholars um, and he edited the book and um, there are some interesting things about the warfare of different, uh, about you know, different approaches uh, to combat. Um, the article which I contributed to this was actually about uh, ancient Greek boxing. Um, so some of the things will be of interest to some of you, others not. If you are much more interested in classics, uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, this is a good book. This again, by, by, uh, edited by my other colleague, uh, in classics, Philip de Souza. Um, I wrote the article in this on uh, uh, Minoan and Mycenaean warfare. Heavily illustrated, um, color illustrations, useful to get access to if you can. Um, do any of you know who Mike Loads is? Nope. Yeah, no? I've seen a few of the documentaries. Yeah, he's a documentary maker. Um, he really was the first person in the making of documentaries about this sort of stuff. Um, uh, he's an expert horseman. He is a very good archer. Um, and uh, really look up his name on YouTube. His documentaries are worth watching. Um, he was called upon to do all sorts of stuff uh, by other people. Um, and he wrote a book specifically about key special swords, um, his favorite swords, his swords with stories. 
um, from different periods. And so he uses a particular sword of a particular period to illustrate something about that period. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very um, almost inspiring book to read again, nicely illustrated. And so that brings us to practicalities. Um, when I designed this uh, module, um, oh, 12, 13 years ago, um, it struck me as being, if I talked about experiential stuff, it was important that there were practicals. Um, <laughs> and then I decided to restart the module and then we have to go into COVID, COVID uh, restrictions. Um, we are going to try and keep to having practicals. Um, in November, towards the end of the semester, um, in the sports center, um, there will be two where we actually do combat work. Um, I will require you to wear proper um, uh, COVID protection um, so that we can maintain some social distancing, etc. If you're at the other end of a sword to somebody else, you're pretty much two meters apart so that you've got adequate social distancing there. That and depends you on the sword. Sorry? That depends on the sword. It does depend on the sword. If you want to get closer, by all means, do so. <laughs> the major part of sword fighting is grappling. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, we need to... We need to, to, to I know, I'm just kidding. We need to be sensible about this. Of course, if you can use a two-handed... Uh, uh, Swiss Montante, you're, you're even more than two meters apart. Spear fencing. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the first class, um, first of the practical, practical class, it'll be sword versus sword, and you'll also have your shields, and we shall have, um, teach you how to use shields and sword. Um, uh, that's, that's less intuitive, actually, using the shield and the sword, um, and we'll cover that. Um, I hope this is the practical class to try and get you all together in one group in a large room. Um, and I will bring some of my own swords um, so that you can get a sense of how to handle them, what are the things to look for. If any of you do have your own swords, you are more than welcome to bring them and talk, talk about them. So we can cover the details of that. Um, and as I said um, in the, on Brightspace, um, we will be joined by um, Lucas Branner, uh, who did this course uh, about 10 years ago. Um, he's a martial arts instructor, um, very capable man with uh, weapons, and he's now a stuntman. So if any of you have those sorts of fantasies, you can talk to him. Um, very easy, friendly, approachable guy. Um, for the practicals, well, you'll get all this information again. Um, you will be bringing your shields, uh, which you will have made. Uh, you'll get instructions on bringing a replica sword, um, not metal. I will not allow any metal in those classes. So it's either wood, uh, padded, uh, or polypropylene. Um, you will need goggles. You will need a mouth guard. You will need to show me that you've got those and you're wearing them uh, before I allow you to spar. Um, yeah, sword handling, etc. assessment. Um, you're not having an exam, but the essays that you're doing would be as though you were going to be doing it as an exam. Three essay questions. But you're going to have two weeks in which to write them. So I hope that's clear. More information as we get closer to the time. Um, and here's just a little bit more about making your own shield. So is all that clear? Yep. Yes. Right. Yes. So we're going to stop.
with the screen share. You can put your cameras back on and you can ask me questions. So you said that um, Puree Pure is a massive part of uh, why they started um, or massive part of the research into weapon systems. But uh, what about LDK, Lichtenhauer, and the Zettel? Um, well, now you're getting into technicalities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, see, I, I, I am a Lichtenhauer practitioner. So. Yeah, of course. Now, um, you know, not, not very many people will be <laughs> um, familiar with that. Lichtenauer is was a teacher, a mm, medieval well, teacher, yeah. and his um, style of fighting with a longsword, a two-handed longsword, um, influenced a lot of other people. But his own text does not survive in a text to other people. Yeah, it's just the commentaries on the Zettel, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see a question. Um, I've given in on Brightspace and in the handbook, which I shall be putting up, um, when you'll be making the shield. You will need the shield ready, um, ready to use uh, on the 25th of November. Yeah, it's not just you're making a shield, you're going to be using the shield. Doesn't that sound like fun? Um, excuse Sorry. me. I, I I have a question as well. Okay, you first. Yeah. Uh, basically, I have a replica of a Soviet 1930s cavalry sword. Is that fine, or is that a bit too old? Oh, oh, oh sorry, too too modern. For, no, uh, you're it, for the for the the day when we are um, going to be looking at swords. We're not going to be fighting with swords. We're just going to be mm -hmm. handling them. You can bring anything you like. All right. And I also have a 1915 uh, sword bayonet from uh, Lee Enfield, I think. So yeah, well, sword bayonet. Yeah, why not? Oh, by the way, um, the the label on this uh, thing here on, uh, but my name is Pavel. By the way, the label is wrong here. Well, that's from your side. All right, all right. Um, I wanted to ask, um, materials for the shields, do they need to be appropriate materials or can we use modern substitutes and it just needs to function? Um, I will, there are a couple of websites with instructions. Um, you can use all the modern materials that you want, plywood, you can use modern tools. You can use a chainsaw if you want. You can use a, you know, whatever you need, a, a, river, a, a ribbon saw. You, and it should be padded. You should have sponge on the front of it. Um, so yes, of course. I'm more concerned about the, the experience that you get from making a shield for your own. I have in the past had people make shields out of metal. Um, either because they themselves or a parent was a metal worker. And those who made sh shields of metal realized something very fast about why ancient shields are not made completely from metal. They're heavy. Um, they don't catch. Not shock resist. No, they don't it, catch. It doesn't absorb shock and they don't catch, yeah. Uh, so oh, what else? Yeah, um, I did have somebody who made a, a, a Mycenaean figure of eight shield from wicker, mm -hmm. but that was basketry. Um, but that was a one-off. Go for it. Go for whatever you want. Uh, do we do we have like a, a standard for the shield? Do we have to make like a run shield, kai shield, or kind of any okay. shield function? Whatever you like. Uh, including some like uh, speciality shield, like uh, like some oriental shield that not exactly a shield, but used as a shield. You want a Gorang? 
Uh, no, Goran is more like uh, it's actually designed for long, like thin stabbing weapons. I'm thinking about a uh, like a spear catcher or things like that. <laughs> Um, you know, I think make make a make a sh make a shield, prop, you know, a proper shield. Okay, so um, a shield or run the shield? style of the shield is up is to you. The preferred material. Okay. Sorry, was there another question there? I was wondering, uh, in, re in relation to the lecture, actually, uh, yeah. I was wondering, uh, you were talking about the like like typologies of weapons, would it be related to something like in, the, it made me think of the biological concept of convergent evolution, where from kind of like two completely different things involved to have the same function and they kind of look the same, but they didn't evolve from the same thing. Would uh, typological analysis of weapons be, uh, I guess, prone to the same types of, uh, I guess, mistakes or, Weaknesses. Um, yes, I mean, there's there's a certain amount of work that you can that has been done, and you can easily do more. I mean, for example, swords are more or less the same all over the world, um, within the parameters of how swords are done. You know, there are, there are curved swords and curved swords over the world look very similar. Straight swords look very similar. Um, it's partly the intersection of human anatomy to the, the idea of, of a weapon. There, there is that. There are, of course, plenty of examples of how um, uh, the diffusion of, of weapons. It's the diffusion of the technology of making, but something which is not really explored is, is talked about and is theorized about in the HEMA community, in the martial arts community, is the, um, the diffusion of fighting styles. So for example, um, there are a lot of people, how many of you have done Filipino martial arts? I no. personally haven't. Stick fighting, short stick fighting, you know. I, I yes, did. I didn't. Yeah, I did and then some of the staff. You can, you can fight. One of the things in, in Filipino stick fighting is you have a stick that's about 24 inches long and you have a short, a short stick, which is about the size of a knife. So if you think about it, it's machete and knife, right? Um, there are a lot of um, European um, martial artists who believe that the believe argue that the development of um, Filipino um, uh, machete and knife derives from the Spanish um, rapier and dagger. Yeah, so again, you know, what's the evidence? What's the argument? Obviously, people tend to think that the thing that they love was the first one. But if you can make an argument for something, then by all means, make the argument. But you need, you need, uh, you need evidence. Well, of course, it's just with anything that's historically or archaeologically based, you do need the evidence where you can rationally and I guess reasonably infer that it's yeah. one thing leading to another. Can't yeah. just make a claim. But we are scholars. There are plenty of people who make claims. We don't make claims. We make the argument. Yeah. yeah. It's just a like I suppose there's the theory but yet to have evidence to really back it up and but you can still make a theory. Or not a theory, you can make a hypothesis. Yes, but a hypothesis requires the process of proof. Oh. It's where people make assertions. Mm, yeah. Yeah. But you see, this is, this is why we go from martial arts to the scholarship of martial arts. Because we essentially establish ourselves as a group of people who is prepared to um, 
make arguments, to use evidence, to take... Well, we understand the whole notion of a warrior from the European point of view, yeah? You know, we, we have a literature of warriors, we have uh, uh, so on. Not all cultures do that. I mean, there is a very famous, for example, Chinese um, phrase, you do not make a soldier out of a good man or a prostitute out of a good woman. woman. And yet, on the other hand, there has the contradictions of the knight errant, the Chunzu. Yeah, so th there are plenty of contradictory things about weaponry, um, the skill of using a sword, um, what it says about a person. Um, generally speaking, martial artists are not considered to be the most educated or intelligent people even in modern society. Yeah, look at, look at any of the uh, newspaper reactions to people who do martial arts or who have weapons in their houses. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, be aware that there are these contradictions um, and that by participating in this sort of scholarship that we're doing, um, we do live with contradictions in, the, in our role in society, but we do also, are also pioneers in, 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 in moving something on about human behavior and also scientific approaches to studying what it is to be human. Gosh, I rendered you all silent. <laughs> and I, I, do, I do get that in that um, modern scholarship tends to shy away a bit from violence or, uh, and I suppose when I was kind of writing about it, I was saying that it is, it is an element of, of human history or human nature. We have to explore it. We have to explore it in the archaeological 